caught in a political wrangle here. I want Fitcher's Bird. You want Fitcher's Bird. <laughs> Let's go to the fairy tale. We did say we were going to do a fairy tale here. Now, Fitcher's Bird is, um, is a story in which uh, the way I'm looking at this tale, um, in which there's a separation of the two worlds again, very similar to Rapunzel. There's, first of all, the world of the peasant father and his daughters who live in poverty. And then there's the world deep in the forest occupied by a wizard with all of his wealth and all of his, uh, his uh, mysterious powers, right? So not unlike Rapunzel again, we have this division in the two worlds between the imagination, the unconscious in, its, in its, all of its potential, and the mundane world. Now, the story starts as what's happening. And here again, this is similar to Rapunzel. The two worlds are breached, bridged, as the wizard goes into the mundane world and starts to what? Capture beautiful daughters, right? And he pulls them into his world. Let's read the first part of the tale. Um, is this just repetition for you? Have you all? How many? How many would like to hear this story? Okay, good. Thank you. There was once a wizard who used to take the form of a poor man, a wizard. Okay. Wizards, again, are demonic figures, right? He went to houses and begged and caught pretty girls. No one knew whither he carried them, for they were never seen again. One day he appeared before the door of a man who had three pretty daughters. He looked like a poor, weak beggar and carried a basket on his back, as if he meant to collect charitable gifts in it. He begged for a little food, and when the eldest daughter came out and was just handing him a piece of bread, he did but touch her and she was forced to jump into his basket. So this is a guy with a lot of charisma. <laughs> right? He did but touch her. He's the wizard with a lot of power, right? He hurried away with long strides and carried her away into the dark forest to his house which stood in the midst of it. Everything in the house was magnificent. He gave her whatever she could possibly desire and said, My darling, you will certainly be happy with me for you have everything your heart can wish for. This lasted a few days. <clears throat> the honeymoon wears off fairly soon. <laughs> and then he said, I have to journey forth and leave you alone for a short time. Here are the keys to the house. You can go everywhere and look at everything except into one room, and this little key opens that room that I forbid you to go into under pain of death. so we already know where she's going, right? <laughs> he likewise gave her an egg and said, preserve this egg carefully for me and carry it continually about with you, for a great misfortune would result from the loss of it. Okay, let's just pause there for a minute. So you get the, the two worlds that are being bridged here again, the world of enchantment, bewitchment, in the forest, a magical palace where everything is possible, but only possible in fantasy. Right? The real world has been left behind now. You can have whatever you want in fantasy. I'll supply you with everything, but you can't look in this one room. This one room is a terrible place. Well, it's not, she doesn't know it's a terrible place. He doesn't say that. So she took the keys and the egg and promised to obey him in everything. When he was gone, she went around all the house from top to bottom and examined everything. The room shone with silver and gold, and she thought that she had never seen such great splendor. At length, she came to the forbidden door. She wished to pass by it, but curiosity let her have no rest. She examined the key. It looked just like any other. She put it in the keyhole, and it turned it just a little 
and the door sprang open. And what did she see when she went in? A great bloody basin stood in the middle of the room, and therein lay the human remains, dead and hewn to pieces. And hard by was a block of wood, and a gleaming axe lay upon it. She was so alarmed that the egg which she held in her hand fell into the bloody basin. She got it out and wiped the blood off, but in vain it appeared again in a moment on the egg. She washed and scrubbed, but she could not get it off. It was not long before the man came back from his journey, and the first thing he asked was where were the key and the egg. She gave them to him, but she trembled as she did so, and he saw at once by the red spots that she had been in the bloody chamber. Since you have gone into the room against my will, he said, you'll go back into it against your own. Your life is ended. He threw her down, dragged her along by the hair, cut off her head on the block, and hewed her into pieces so that her blood ran on the ground. Then he threw her into the basin with the rest. This is not a fairy tale that you want to tell your young children. <clears throat> then he fetches the second, and we go through this whole bloody process all over again, because the second one does the same. Um, and then he goes after the third. And the third is Wiley. The third daughter is Wiley. And she sets the egg aside and protects it very carefully before she goes into the room. In other words, she takes seriously what he's told her. And when she goes into the room, alas, what did she behold? Both her dear sisters lay there in the basin, cruelly murdered, cut into pieces. But she began to gather their limbs together and put them in order, head, body, arms, and legs. And when nothing further was wanting, the limbs began to move and unite themselves. And both the maidens opened their eyes and were once more alive. They rejoiced and kissed and caressed each other. On his arrival, the man at once demanded the keys and the egg, and as he could perceive no trace of any of the blood on it, he said, You have stood the test. You shall be my bride. He now lo no longer had any power over her and was forced to do whatever she desired. Okay? Um, now, um, let me tell you, uh, a story here, if I can find it. Um, uh, just a minute. This is a, a case which I think illustrates, um, well, let's talk about the issue of aggression in the formation of the true self, because this is what, really what we're talking about here. Um, remember last night I said that if you're going to get from primary undifferentiated infantile omnipotence, in, this is object relations theory, to a reality ego, you have to go through a transitional period, and I talked about that transitional period where the mother, uh, through her empathy, knows that her baby is hungry, the baby's hallucinating the breast, the mother puts the breast exactly where the hallucination is, and the two worlds are joined up, the world of reality and the world of fantasy. That's one part of transitional relatedness. In order to get a true self, you have to have that experience well enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it, you have to have some of it in order for the world of imagination and fantasy to get joined up. The second thing that you have to go through is that's on the love axis. But we all know that's only one part of the psyche of all of us. What about aggression? Well, when talking about aggressive aspects of the mother-infant dyad, Winnicott has this to say. He calls the state from which the infant is moving the state of omnipotence or object relating. This is somewhat confusing language, but those of you who are therapists um, will probably encounter this again, so bear with me a minute. This stage, he says, of omnip omnipotence is entirely illusory
full of projective identifications. He calls the state towards which the baby is moving object use, the ability to use an object to get stronger, to grow healthier. And he says destructiveness is an important part of this transitional process. As the mother begins to separate from the baby, the baby has an impulse to destroy the mother. I don't know whether you believe this, but um, if you've ever been in a symbiotic attachment with a borderline patient and you try to separate, you know what this feels like, okay? So it is true, separation in the symbiotic phase can be experienced as a devastating thing by an infant. Winnicott used to say that when we end the hour with such a patient, it's a hateful thing and we have to take responsibility for the fact that this is how it can be experienced. So as the mother separates from the baby who is merged in in the dual unity of the symbiotic phase, the baby has an impulse to destroy the mother. The question is, will the mother survive the child's ruthlessness without retaliating? And here is Winnicott's famous paragraph from this article called The Use of an Object. After subject relates to object, comes subject destroys object. In other words, after the symbiotic phase, the mother separates and the baby wants to destroy her. Wants to destroy her as she becomes external to him. And then comes object survives destruction by subject. There may or may not be survival, however. A new feature thus arrives in the theory of object relating. The subject says to the object, I destroyed you. And the object is there to receive the communication. From now on, the subject says, hello object, I destroyed you. I love you. You have value for me now because you survived my destruction of you. While I am loving you now, I can all the time be destroying you if I want in fantasy. Here there's a differentiation between fantasy as an inner reality and relationship with an outer reality. So in Winnicott's model, an interior world develops alongside an outer world that can enrich the interior world. The baby can now get fat by taking in food from the outside He's relinquished his omnipotent illusion of self-sufficiency in that dual union by letting his love and hate be felt now towards the same person. He has binocular vision. He's, he's gained a sense of reality. So if the same mother can both survive the attack of the aggressive infant and mirror the spontaneous gesture of the loving infant, then something miraculous happens. Winnicott calls this the development of, of a reality ego. He says the inner world and the outer world are born simultaneously. And he also says that when that happens, something comes to indwell in the body of the child and personalization happens. Now, I think Fitcher's Bird is about this, or at least this is one way we could think about it. Um, we could say that the wizard initially represents the primal archaic infant self in both its creative and here in the story, primarily destructive aspects. His magnificent house in the deep forest is a fantasy place representing the split off positive side of the numinous, still disincarnate but providing a self-soothing refuge for these daughters. The problem is that this refuge has a hidden room and therein lies all the evil dark side of the numinous world the, in its unregenerate form. These two sides of the archaic self must come together in the suffering of the tale's daughters. And we see how this happens. Two of them get chopped up into pieces. Yet somehow the third daughter is able to make use of the positive side of, of the wizard's numinous energies, the wholeness dimension, 
that he has provided a symbol of in the egg. In other words, this wizard is giving the key to his own transformation to the daughters. It's like the witch in Rapunzel. She wants to enter the real world. She doesn't know how to do it except to steal a baby. But she wants to, to leave her world of, of total bewitchment all alone in the woods, in the forest. But she can't find anybody. Now I'm changing venues here. The wizard can't find anybody to survive his power. So he gives the third daughter a key to surviving his destructive power. And she takes him seriously. And she hides the egg. And now he can say to her, hello object, I tried to destroy you, but you survived my destruction of you. Now I love you. You've liberated me from my own destructive identification. See, people who are possessed by destructive energies, deep down, they want somebody to survive this so that they can reach to their own humanness, their own woundedness, their own vulnerability. They always want that person who they've just murdered to survive it. I mean, they want it and they don't want it. But in this case, it's a story about the transformation of archetypal rage into more human form. Are you following me here? Does this make sense to you? Kevin? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I will. <clears throat> um, let me give you an example. A married woman came to see me whose husband kept torturing her about an affair that she had had 20 years earlier. He found out about this affair about 10 years into the marriage and it created such a terrible rift in the relationship that um, this person tried to atone for it in all kinds of different ways. Um, he claimed that she never had made him feel loved or special and this harping went on for years and years and years and was relentless to the point where she despite all of her efforts to reassure him that he was special and so on, had begun to develop asthma. Uh, she had a tendency to feel very guilty about almost everything in her life. And so when he went on a rage about this, and it wouldn't happen all the time, it would usually happen, it would all blow over and then he would have a few too many drinks and it would all come up again. She cooked him special dinners. She got special uh, nightgowns that were really sexy that he wanted her to have uh, that would restore his faith that she really did love him as a sexual partner as well as a, as a husband. Nothing really assuaged his complaints or his cold withdrawals. So this went on for years, literally, and she was slowly losing any hope for the marriage and getting worse and worse. So she went to therapy. And there, she found an egg. She began to realize that separate from the husband's complaints, there was a self-attacking wizard in her own psyche and a hideous room in which she was dismembered regularly by his acts. The husband's complaints, she realized, were merely the outer occasion for a diabolical inner attack against which she was totally defenseless. Each outer complaint was amplified by the inner wizard's acts inside herself and thus her husband, she felt deep down, spoke the truth about her. She really was a shit. And she knew it all her life. She was a bad person. But slowly, as, as she got in touch with this inner figure through a lot of dream work, it began to dawn on this very compliant patient that if the problem were to be solved with her husband, she would have to first break the spell of her inner self-destructive uh, tyrant. 
So slowly, with the help of psychotherapy, she began to get in touch with her own aggression. That is, she began to peek into her own hideous room. This meant losing her innocence as the divine victim of an unreasonable husband who criticized her all the time, and it meant taking responsibility for her own rage and her own aggression. Slowly and incrementally, she reached into this forbidden room in herself and took back some of the wizard's energy back into herself. In one final confrontation, she told her husband that his constant complaints were no longer tolerable and that she wouldn't stay with him if he continued this barrage of blame. She candidly stated that he ought to take some responsibility for his own feelings for her and stop hiding his own lack of feelings for her behind these whining inflated complaints about not being made to feel special enough. She really let him have everything. To her utter amazement, this completely ended his power over her. All this imperious rage and petulant complaining and fetching and whining that he had been doing in his tyrannical way evaporated and he suddenly felt very human, respectful, and loving towards her as though he needed her to liberate him from his own inflated bullying wizard. You see how I'm using that as an analogy to what's going on in the fairy tale? It's like you sometimes can't end the wizard's tyranny unless you take a piece of his own energy. And this gets to what we were talking about yesterday, that the trauma complex is usually a very slick way that the psyche has of um, using the aggression that is liberated when the self is being dissed by a parent or whatever to repress all the neediness that comes up and the innocence. So you get this aggression repressing need or aggressive wizard repressing vulnerable feminine parts of the self. And so when you're attempting to heal, it, doesn't, it isn't enough uh, for the healing of trauma to just be loved back into health. Usually you have to go through something that you hate to go through, which is you have to, you have to find your way to some of your own aggression. And you have to own it, you know? And that doesn't mean doing destruction just wantonly. It just means you have to be more honest with yourself. You're not only the wounded victim. You are also, you've got other things going on inside you. And you have to take responsibility for those things too. And often what they are is that all this aggression uh, that you can feel like a mama bear towards wounded birds uh, is, is really yours. And you've got to find a more effective way of getting it into life. It can't be just your fantasies of destruction. Um, sometimes, you know, one of the ways that we find this incarnated in, in in the world is, is it, um, you know, all of us in the helping professions usually outpicture our own wounding at first in our patients. And we go about rescuing our patients in order to heal ourselves. That's the cynical view, okay? That's Alice Miller's diagnosis of psychotherapists. <laughs> psychotherapists have all been narcissistically wounded, abandoned, and neglected by parents have forced, been forced to be mediators in their families and so make a profession out of mediating pathology in other people and are basically healing themselves. Uh, and there is enough truth in this to make us all very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes other forms. Uh, I mean, sometimes uh, I've been shocked um, to find that some of my ruthless, most tyrannical uh, patients who are very counterdependent and self-sufficient and tough and armored and you know 
very powerful in, in, in their opinions and their attitudes and they, you know, they're very maybe big people in the world and so forth have this incredible um, you know <laughs> knee wobbling passion for wounded little animals or injured creatures um, I had one woman I worked with who uh, came into the session one, one day and and said, I, have, I can't have my session today. Uh, do you have a cardboard box? And I, I, I said, well, what, what's happened? And down on the stoop of my building in New York, there was a pigeon. Now, there were hundreds of pigeons in New York. They were always sitting around in, on the front veranda of this big building that I practiced in because the, the elderly women in the building would always come down and feed them. So there were billions of pigeons down there. But there was one pigeon who had a wing that was drooping and my patient said I have to take this pigeon to the vet I, I couldn't believe this she was ready to give up her, her therapy session with me <laughs> to aid a pigeon <laughs> well when I expressed my incredulity and my sort of gaping mouthed dismay that she, what? She flew into a rage. And then I got a real good dose of her tyrannical interject. And I became a truly demonic, insensitive son of a bitch, a typical man who had no sensitivity to the real life around, you know, I probably never even noticed the injuries to, to the natural world and this was impossible to avoid and she was not about to avoid it and so I took a deep breath and found a cardboard box <laughs> <laughs> and actually made an arrangement so that the pigeon could wait downstairs uh, with the doorman <laughs> with some bread while she had her session, which uh, I'm, I'm sure I was in a sort of an altered state <laughs> during this session. Uh, there was, needless to say, no symbolic work that could go on on this at, at this time. <laughs> I didn't try to ask this woman to, to get in touch with the inner pigeon. Uh, because that was not an appropriate dialogue <laughs> at this time in the, in the process. Um, but somehow we survived this and, uh, you know, went on to, to do the work. And, and she then became able to reflect on this later with some humor and, and say, you know, we, we later knew about it as our pigeon episode. And, uh, but she, she had and she... I'm sure continues to have a deep and abiding sensitivity to wounded animals and uh, because they're innocent and because her own innocence was violated um, and you know so uh, Jerry Bernstein in Santa Fe wrote a beautiful article about this um, called The Borderlands um, he, he said, you know, we've always heard about our borderline patients. And I've worked with them, he said, and, you know, I was working with one particular patient who, on her way to a session, he, he tells a story in the, in the, in the um, article. A cattle car passed her, taking steers to the slaughterhouse. And that's all she could talk about in her session. And he worked with her like a good Jungian analyst would work with this material. Well, what, what's being outpictured in this cattle car of your own psychology? What, what, why do you suppose this touched you so deeply? And she went along with him. And she did some good work during the session. But as she was leaving the session, she said, 
but what about the cows? And she wouldn't come off of this. And Jerry, who had worked for many years in Aboriginal culture, uh, in the uh, Indian culture of the Navajo, in the American Southwest, said, I've heard this before. I'd heard this before. I realized I'd heard this before. In the Native American reverence for life. And so he, in his article, he makes the point that people who have this sensitivity do a huge amount of good with their sensitivity if they can get it linked up to some genuine concern for whatever, in this case, animal rights or, or just the, the plight of the earth as, as we're violating it in, in this day and age. And it's a very sensitive and tender article, and I really recommend it to you because it's, it sort of reframes what we're talking about here, which is this exquisite dimension of depth of feeling for the, for the violated innocence in, in uh, the prematurely divided, uh, violated innocence in, in the psyche. And, and what Jerry Bernstein, B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N. The article is published in a journal which you may or may not have ever heard of. It's called the Salt Journal. Oh, yeah. You know about the mm -hmm. Salt Journal? It mm -hmm. was originally published, and then it went out of print for a couple of years, and now it's back. Uh, there's a... I'm sorry? It's gone again? Oh, no. I'm so sorry. It, it was a, wonder, a lovely piece, and it was... Um, I think Wynette Barton, who's part of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in Texas, uh, her son was the editor of it for a while. And uh, it, it had some wonderful things in it. I'm sure it's available. I'm sure you could find it somewhere on the web or something. I think it was printed this last year in Noetic Sciences uh, newsletter. Was it? In the Noetic Sciences newsletter? That particular article by Bernstein? The borderlands, something about borderlands, you know, into the borderlands or something like that. Um, okay. How Kevin? Long ago, how long ago in the Salt Journal was it? You how long ago in the Salt Journal? A year and a half ago? Okay. Kevin? I had in the uh, spirit tale, sister rescues her other sister is um, Luke goes on to Mary and she speaks out of the way. Mm -hmm. Yet in this, the, the husband, um, which gives herself, she confronts him. Apparently, the marriage turns out okay. Yeah. But in the other, it doesn't. You know, I'm just wondering if the spiritual, because the wizard gets a man. Ah, you're identifying with the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Right, the wizard gets abandoned, not only abandoned, but incinerated. I thought the uh, wizard was Bin Laden. You thought the wizard was Bin Laden? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, let's not put that on Bin Laden. No, it doesn't. It, well, it does to this extent. Um, the fairy tale is about the transformation of the wizard through the feminine. Right. And in the fairy tale, the wizard's transformation does not end up happily ever after, unfortunately. He's transformed in the fire. Uh, but one of the things that these stories don't seem to do very well is follow the transformation story about the wizards and the witches. For example, in Rapunzel, we don't hear about the witch after, after she chops off the hair and pokes the eyes out and throws them out of the tower. Um, we don't hear what this means to her. That's why I wanted this tale, because <laughs> in this story, I think we do see more of, of the transformation of the dark side of the self and its wish for transformation than we did in Rapunzel. Granted, it doesn't come out very completely. Uh, You mean, you mean when you're working with this kind of diabolical, rageful yeah. kind of uh, possession in, in people?
Yeah. Are you talking about working with um, like prison inmates or these are combat vets, but combat vets, yeah, um, okay, and especially Vietnam vets. Mm -hmm. There's just this incredible amount of rage that protects that real violate itself. Yes, and uh, when working with them, they're not going to let that go uh, completely. I I've right. never seen any of them get past being able to do that. It's not a matter of desire; it's just a matter of it, it's too entrenched. Okay. They come into treatment. Yeah. Well, you know, um, we have to make room for that, that, that it's conceivable that people have been so traumatized that the possibilities for transformation have been seriously limited or wounded. Um, we always carry the hope that that can happen. Um, I was just talking to Don Huntley um, about an article I read which makes the point that many of the fantasy, um, much of the fantasy material that's currently in, uh, in the movie theaters nowadays and in fantasy literature like Harry Potter, uh, Lord of the Rings, um, and so forth, uh, the, the point the article was making is that many of these fantasies have to do with a battle between good and evil in which evil is vanquished by the powers of good, overcome in battle. Um, and the writer, who was a woman, said, these are stories of the battle between good and evil, and they're heroic battles. But it's more a masculine psychology, and they're not transformation stories. Because in order to get a transformation story, you need the inclusion of the feminine which is very interesting to me. Yeah, you know, I don't know where you, it's, it's in the New York Times. Um, if you give me your address before I leave, I'll see if I can't fax it to you or something. Um, it was just a commentary about what, what we're seeing so much of in the current culture. Now, the, Fitcher's Bird is a story of the transformation of this complex through the feminine, gaining its own integrity. You know, by integrity we mean, uh, you know, the basis of that word is integer, one, not two. To have integrity means that you're whole, and part of the heroine here was that the feminine was not whole. The feminine didn't have any access to its own aggression. It, it takes aggression to have a self in the world doesn't take aggression to have a self in fantasy. But it takes aggression to have a self in the world. So the integration of aggression to differentiate the self in the world is necessary in the feminine in this story in, if the wizard is going to be transformed. And the example I gave of the woman in her marriage was the same. It was, it was that she had to find a way to access her own aggression in the service of selfhood, which was being violated. First by her, she realized, and then by him, right? Now, the Vietnam vet who has had, who has had multiple cumulative trauma and who has had to be so armored against any intrusion or invasion of the feminine, of the vulnerable parts of the self, probably can only release that in a very safe environment it's got to happen over time. It's probably got to be in a context where uh, the vet feels understood by another man who knows what that kind of rage is like. And the outer circumstances are going to have to align themselves in such a way that they provide all that if the person is going to heal at all. And you're going to have that rageful demon ready to take over if that environment changes. We saw a lot of that was September 11th. I mean, it really yeah. started out. Just, I was thinking in, in the movie Gladiator. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen that. Russell Crowe. But it, it, you see this incredible battle between this, these two forces. And I was just thinking about the feminine energy. They're both 
gotten the Caesar's name, but uh, it's his sister and her son, and they're pretty much prisoners of, of this Caesar who's just brutal. Um, but she's in love with Crow, the gladiator. But it's a battle between the two of them, and then ultimately they kill each other, and she, she's free at that point. And then she has the son that she has to protect and raise up. So mm -hmm. really good archetypical. Film. Very archetypal. Sounds like right out of Osiris and Set and the, uh, the feminine who, uh, Isis, who gives birth to Horus, the son, who then redeems the kingdom after these two have sort of annihilated each other. Uh, it's sort of like the next generation. This generation can't transform, but the next generation may be. You know, you, you do see this in cultures and, and in lives, you know, you, you're not going to make it in this life, but maybe your son can, can do it. Let's look at the final part of our fairy tale now, because uh, so the wizard says, uh, okay, I'm going to marry you, you survived my destruction of you, and now you're it, so get ready. She says, oh, very well. However, first I have a few things that you have to do. <clears throat> I want you to take a basket full of gold to my father and mother. Carry it on your back. In the meantime, I will prepare for the wedding. She then ran to her reassembled sisters, who she had hidden in a little chamber, and said, Come on, the moment has come. I can save you now. The wretch himself is going to carry you home. And as soon as you're home, send our brothers and, and their kinsmen to help us. So she put them both in the basket, covered them over with a lot of gold so that nothing of them could be seen. Then she called to the wizard and said to him, now carry the basket away, but I'm going to look through my little window and watch to see if you stop on the way or take a rest. So the wizard said, okay. He raised the basket on his back and went away with it, but it weighed him down so heavily that the sweat streamed from his face. Then he sat down and wanted to rest a little while, but immediately one of the girls in the basket cried, I'm looking out my little window and I see that you are resting. Go on at once. He thought it was his bride who was talking to him. This wizard is not real swift. <laughs> so he got up in his shaky legs again. Once more he was going to sit down, but instantly she cried, I'm looking out my little window. I see you're resting. Go on directly. Whenever he stood still, she cried this, and then he was forced to go onwards until at last, groaning and panting and out of breath, he took the basket with the gold and the two maidens into the parents' house. At home, the bride prepared the marriage feast and sent invitations to all the friends of the wizard. She then took a skull with grinning teeth, put some ornaments on it and a wreath of flowers, carried it upstairs to the garret window, and put it there and let it look out over the surrounding country. When all was ready, she got into a barrel of honey and then cut the feather bed open and rolled herself in it until she looked like the most wondrous bird and no one could recognize her. Then she went out of the house and on her way she met many of the wedding guests who were coming. And the wedding guests asked, Oh, Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I, I come from Fitcher's house quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? Ah, from cellar to garret, she's sweeping all clean. And now from the window, she's peeping, I ween. So at last, she repeats this several times along the way, and she meets the bridegroom himself, who is now exhausted, coming slowly back, sort of a broken man. And he also says, oh, Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? Now, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, nobody questions whether this bird is real or, uh, uh, you know, someone in disguise. It's, a, it's transitional space, right? 
you don't ask the baby, did you find this or did you, did you make it up? It's both. It's always both in this space. And, and this is the transitional space between the imagination deep in the woods and the world of outer reality. The bridegroom looks up and he sees the decked out skull and he nods to it thinking that it is his bride and he greets it kindly. But when he and his guests have all gone into the house, the brothers and the kinsmen of the bride ride up. They've been sent, to, sent for and they rescue her. They lock all the doors of the house so that no one can escape. They set fire to it and the wizard and all of his crew had to burn. End of story. Hence Kevin's dissatisfaction. We don't really, <laughs> yes. But help me understand why she already had power over him to make him go out carrying this heavy load on his back and not able to stop to rest. If she already has this power over him, why does she need to go through this deception and have somebody come back and rescue her? <laughs> You're not supposed to do this with fairy tales, you see. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the answer to that, right? I mean, the way I'm approaching the tale, she doesn't have total power over him. He isn't totally transformed yet, and she needs help from the outside world if she's going to truly uh, be liberated from him, right? But one of the things is, you know, the trickster element in this fairy tale is very interesting to think about because, you know, Frequently, we saw the trickster element end entering in Rapunzel, and we see it here too. The first, there is the trick of the wizard, right? Uh, he tricks people into thinking he's just a beggar, and and yet they jump into his basket, and then he takes them to the dark woods, and he he gives them this puzzling, sort of tricky message. And there's the trick with the egg and all this. Now it's as though once she's once she's found her way to her own integrity, she's now the trickster. Uh, she's tricking him with the basket and the voices. She tricks him with the skull in the window. She tricks him with the bird, mm -hmm. right? So she is now becoming a master of, um, of, of this doubleness. Now, one of the things that we find in mythology and fairy tales is that the trickster image is frequently um, related to the healing uh, arts. The shaman is frequently a trickster. Actually shamans dress in bird feathers. Um, but the trickster element is, is often uh, part of what, what transforms the psyche that's sort of stuck in its categories or behind its defenses. The, the very oldest gods were trickster gods. They always had two sides. And you never knew quite what you were dealing with. That's why Jung loved Mercurius, duplex. Jung was very concerned about Christianity because the good figure of Jesus, which now had no bad left in it, the bad was all left over to his, either the Antichrist or the devil, right? And Jung says, Jung always preferred the gods like the Eastern Shiva, who were creator and destroyer in one, and, uh, or Mercurius Duplex, who was both the, the light bringer and the sandaled god who could go between all the realms. He could, frequently, he, could, he was a shapeshifter. He could change shape. So he could enter this realm as this, he could enter that realm as this. You know, trickster energies are called up in us as therapists working with, say, the kind of patient that Kevin is mentioning and the kind of patient that I was talking about with the Kubota John Deere uh, tractor thing. Um, I had to pretend that I was an ass-kicking son of a bitch. Okay, in order to appeal to this guy and make him feel any kind of safety in my presence, like I understood him or I, I was part of his world. 
And I could do that because that is in me, right? Hopefully integrated with some other parts of me. Um, <laughs> but we're called upon to play different roles with people um, and different parts of the self. If we're going to be therapists to people who are split, we're going to have to know about the vulnerable places of innocence in ourselves and we're going to have to know also about our own rage. And we're going to have to have some way of moving back and forth between those two things. And the trickster gods were always ones who were shapeshifters. So they're always the healing gods, the ones who are called in when the bifurcated world or the split situation needs to have uh, some communication back and forth. You know, Jung's whole idea and answer to Job was that he saw Yahweh as the trickster god. Yahweh was the God who, you know, chose Moses as the, as the hero to liberate the people. But then he sent his angel out on the road to kill him. He's the God who, you know, saw Job as such a righteous um, and, and good man until the, the devil convinced him that maybe Job really was doing all this for effect and ought to be tested. So he put Job through his paces. And Jung's whole idea is that the split in, in the Godhead in that Old Testament story is healed because Job never lose, loses sight of God's goodness even when God is persecuting him. So Job can see the doubleness in God as, as Edinger, Edward Edinger puts this, Job never lost sight of the fact that he could find in God an advocate against God. In other words, he, he held his love for God and God's love for him together with his hatred for God and God's hatred for him. He didn't identify with just the one side. And, and for that reason, it's Jung's analysis, that God could see his own destructiveness and make reparation by incarnating as the God of love in Christ. That, that's Jung's analysis. That's Jung's fantasy, really, uh, imposed on this material. So, you know, Yahweh is the split, uh, the split archetypal defense, the two sides of the self, the wizard who wants to be transformed but is waiting for a Job or the third daughter to show him how. That's basically what we're working with. I don't know how I got off on all this with about Mercurius and so forth, but it, it has some <laughs> relationships to what we were talking about. Well, it's also as though the daughter had to find her aggressive nature rather than just yeah. saying to the wizard at that point, oh, I forgive you for all you've done to me. And She had to find her doubleness see, if she were going to be the therapeutic personality for the, for the wizard, she had to be double. She had to be a trickster. Yeah, that's how we got started in this. She had to find her own aggression. She had her own compliance. She was a pretty girl who knew how to comply and be a good girl. She didn't know how to be a bad girl. On her own. Not just bad defined by him, but bad the way she wanted to be bad. So, and same with my patient. She had never been a bad girl and therefore found it, um, guess what? She found a voice in herself that was always telling her that she was a bad girl. But she had never owned any of her own badness. And as soon as she did, the voice got weaker inside her. See, that's the way these defenses work. We've got to take a little piece out of the demon in order to rob the demon of its strength. Yes, please. Um, let's get the mic back here. I have two questions, but I'll make them, try to run them together here. First, is the opposite true? about getting, if you have to get in touch with your aggressiveness, if you have not gotten in touch with the 
compliance side of you, does there have to be some mesh of the two, or is it is primarily aggression? Yeah, there has to be a mesh of the two. Um, the, I, uh, I assume that was true. Yeah. Um, like these vets, for example, have to get in touch with their own femininity and their own vulnerability and their own desire to please. To find healing and wholeness. To find, find their wholeness. Yeah. Now, the other question, in, when you were talking about getting in touch with this aggressiveness, you're talking about adults, right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your question? Well, well I'm I'll figure out what I'm talking about. I'm wondering about. about how to treat, how, or about the treatment of children uh -huh. who have already suffered, perhaps at that pre-verbal stage, the trauma, the abuse, the whatever that has that has caused them to pr to put the that protected the egg in the in the shell to protect it. Mm -hmm. They're full of the rage and aggression in many cases. Or if they're not, if they have become that compliant child, is there a difference in the way you deal with that than with an adult who has the maturity, perhaps, to deal with it and handle it? Well, a child who's full of rage is obviously, um, you know, we have to keep in mind anger is a real affect, but it's especially um, important in differentiation of the self. It takes, a, takes aggression to have a self. Reactive aggression is a defense, right? So children that are overwhelmed by their rages and, and wreaking havoc on their environment with their rage are possessed by archetypal affects that they need to be liberated from, right? Uh, so the question then is, what do you do with a child who's filled with rage? And, and you know, first of all, <coughs> containment is important, right? It has to be contained in, a, in an environment where, yeah, well, and, and, and then if it can be moved into constructive behavior, that's, that's part of the healing. Like, for example, a lot of the people that go to some of these physical workout things like Outward Bound and so forth need to find a way of getting their aggression into an adaptive and masterful kind of activity. But I guess your question is, does it differ from work with adults in the psychotherapy setting? See, adults in the psychotherapy setting are not so overcome by rage and probably have more capacity for reflection than a child who's completely possessed by it. And um, so, yeah, it's easier to work with an adult who has some reflective capacity. But I think the same thing is true about loving the person who can stand it. Yes. Because you yeah. And who doesn't hurt them in the process of standing it. That's right. That's right. She's saying the same thing is true about loving the person who survives it and who can stand it because the child, although possessed by this rage, wants on some level to be liberated from it and needs a partner who is up to that process, right? Yes. Uh, in, a, in, a in a constructive way. Winnicott says if you're going to be the person that survives destruction, all you have to do is not change. He says, the, if you're attacked by a patient in a rage in a psychotherapy hour, changing means, changing and therefore being destroyed, means that you become someone different. You lose your boundaries. You, you, the worst thing is that you can do is retaliate, you know? And psychotherapists do a lot of retaliating. Uh, we call it interpretation. <laughs> there are many times when we're in a, a real difficult pickle with a patient, and guess what we end up doing? We, we end up formulating what's just going on in terms of the patient's dynamics. And uh, it's really a nasty thing to do at, a moment, at certain moments. N not at all moments. I mean, I do a lot of interpreting, but I don't do nearly as much as I used to do. Um, but the main thing that, the main point is, in order to survive the destructive rage of a person, 
you just have to maintain your boundaries and maintain your neutrality and look into it and not either be totally cowed by it and overwhelmed and intimidated or not retaliate, but have a place in which you can house it and look into it with the client or give the client other means to express it. For example, um, Gustav Bogensieden uh, of Germany presented a wonderful paper in Prague about just such a child. The child wanted to murder him and he just simply gave him drawing materials and says, draw what you want to do to me. And the child drew what he wanted to do to him. And then the child said, okay, you got the holes in you now, what are you going to do? So Gustav took the pen and drew another figure. I forget what, whether the figure was dead or, or trying to escape or trying to hide, put up a shield or whatever. But, but the aggression then went back and forth in this sort of dialogue drawing. And what he had done at that moment was he'd given more resources to the child to express the rage. You know, instead of, in, in a way that he could do it without being destructive and actually the, the dialogue drawing of cartoon figures then became a game. And so pretty soon the aggression was now in, a, in another frame. It was in a game between the two of them. And that was transforming it already. But he was allowing the expression of it. There's a fine line between allowing the expression and forcing the compliance. Absolutely. And the, forcing the compliance may create more aggression than it's okay. Well, how would offering drawing materials be forcing a compliance? Yeah, because I can't quite see that. I, I, unless you, you mean he's a therapist and now the patient is complying with his therapeutic. No, I, no I'm sorry. I, I jumped in my head. That exercise, that type of therapy absolutely works without forcing the compliance. Yeah. In other therapies, it can be repressive. Right. You're not allowed to have those Yeah. One of the best um, articles we have, one of the very first ones, about creative arts expressive psychotherapies is by C.G. Jung in 1916. Um, it's his essay on the transcendent function. And he says, um, the psyche will picture its own transformation if we give it the means. He said, therefore, in my work with patients over the years, I've asked them to dance their feelings or play it in music or draw it or paint it. And he says, in the very gesture of the, of the hand that holds the pencil or the hand that holds the brush or the, the foot that does the dance step, he says, we find something precipitates itself into plastic form. Jung's language. Something outpictures itself, something makes itself known. And so what we want to do in, often in the work with people is to give them more resources, give them other media to express feelings that can't be expressed otherwise. And that's how, part of how we transform this untransformable rage. Yes, question. Uh, should we get the mic over to this young lady? Uh, the inner child and all of that and Adult trauma. You, you talk a lot about sexual abuse. I haven't really heard much about the kind of abuses, unless it's maybe like being thrown out in the snow, where you know maybe it, it wasn't all that terrible, except that you were only two. Mm -hmm. um, but what's the parallel in the way you, or as therapists, view? The adult who's been uh, kidnapped with a gun in their ear and mm -hmm. raped or yeah. or pushed in underwater or yeah. buried alive and they mm -hmm. survive and in <coughs> and if you have a series of these things and and say this person what maybe they had this reasonably well-managed childhood that you talked about mm -hmm. with maybe 
oh, and, and that was all. It was just normal. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the child who it was reasonably well managed, but maybe there were some traumas that were either sexual abuse or, I don't know, getting locked in a closet or said, you can't cry or I'll beat you up. Mm -hmm. um, but what's the parallel between this this transformation of a, of a child into this adult ego and the adult that may or may not have achieved this transformation, yet they are traumatized mm -hmm. in a way. So, you know, you all leave off where we are now. <laughs> so, I mean, what, where do yeah. you go from... How, do, how does an adult, or if you treat adults that have been traumatized to the point where they go into a d depression or they do or don't function, or another event triggers it. Um, there was a girl here in Atlanta named Julie Love that was kidnapped and it took three years or so, but somebody finally talked and they found her skull in the woods not too far from here. She was a kindergarten teacher and had run out of gas. Um, and that brought up some other types of things that have happened in this area, uh, you know, children that disappeared. But anyway, so the, this girl was an adult. She didn't survive, so, mm -hmm. but say she had. What would you, I mean, where do you, where is this transformation and what's the co correlation between and what's the parallel? I mean, where do you go from the type of Jungian analysis you all are talking about to make it through until you're 98 years old? Well, it's a very good question, and I'm glad for your question because it allows me to help clarify um, the quick answer to your question is that you would you would take somebody like that into a, the safety of a therapy situation if you could supply it, um, and you would ask them to tell the story and retell the story in as many ways and through as many medium as they could. Um, you would ask them to tell you, you would ask them to dream into that space, you would ask them to draw it, you would ask them everything about it, and you would keep doing that. And what you find when you work with adult trauma of that kind is that slowly, um, this doesn't work all the time, it depends on the person, because if this person is some individual who had a history of early trauma, then it's going to be activated by the later trauma. And these defenses that I'm talking about will come up and come into play and make it much more difficult for them to get over what happened to them later. But Harry Wilmer, who's a Jungian analyst who uh, has formed a, um, an institution called the Institute for the, for the Humanities in Salado, Texas, did a lot of work with returning vets from Vietnam who were traumatized in their work, I mean, in their soldiering. Um, and not just battle fatigue. This was, these were young men who had experiences that were unbearable for them, like their best friend would offer to take the point position from them and end up with their head blown off um, right in front of them and die in their arms. And things that were so awful for them that they couldn't <coughs> They couldn't sleep. And one of the things that Harry Wilmer found is that in their dreams, their dreams were not symbolizing anything. The dreams were simply repeating the traumatic incident, literally. So that they, these men were afraid to go to sleep because they'd be re-traumatized in their sleep. And you could medicate them, but Wilmer wasn't satisfied with that. And so, he would ask them to tell their dream over and over again. And he would form a relationship with them. And they would talk about what happened, and they'd talk about the guy's history, and they'd talk about whatever came up in the sessions. And what he found is that if you ask this man to repeat this in a relationship, slowly, 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 the literal concrete repetition of the dream started to change. Um, maybe it would be Harry Wilmer in the foxhole who had his head blown off. Or 
a slight change in the meaning of the dream would come up. And slowly, because the relationship meant something, it was in the context of a relationship with a caring other that the psyche could start to symbolize and pretty soon the dream would change from its literal content and it then became a normal dream in which the symbolic process gave him a little protection and what, what they found is that these vets then could sleep and the trauma was in the process of being changed. So, you know, we don't have, uh, I mean, some of the techniques that are now worked with EMDR, body work of various kinds, um, uh, all are helpful, dream work, but these expressive arts therapies that I was talking about are some of the best ways we have of helping people um, to slowly begin the slow agonizing process of allowing the psyche to hold something that it can't hold. See, the psyche needs symbolic matrix and a safe interpersonal environment in order to do its work of healing. Uh, and a safe human environment 